Well, good morning. Ooh, how are we doing this morning? I'm hearing some life and some energy. What I'm hearing is some people are like, ooh, I'm going to go on vacation next week. Woo! No? The other, the, the, some of you were excited. Then I mentioned vacation. Then you started groaning because you're like, oh, family holidays. Ah, so... This will help with this, I promise, this will help. Um, hey, before we dive in, uh, I just wanna introduce myself. My name is Kyle, I'm one of the pastors here. If we haven't met before, we just wanna say thank you for coming. Whatever brought you here, uh, whether again, there's something that's drawing you towards Jesus, you were coerced by a family member or you drove into the wrong parking lot, you thought you were here for Black Friday deals, we're just so glad that you're here. You see, we're, we're just a bunch of imperfect people held together by the perfect love of Jesus. And about 20 years ago, Jesus totally transformed my life. And I know he can do the same for you. He taught me, he took me from a rebel without a cause to someone who had peace in my heart and purpose in my life. And so my experience has been that following Jesus is the best life that you could ever live. And so this morning, we just want to introduce you to him or reintroduce you, or maybe help you figure out what does it actually mean to follow him? So friends, will you go ahead and put your hands together and welcome our guest this morning? I have a theory. My theory is this. It is really easy to say, I'm sorry. It's really hard to be sorry. I learned this, um, I'll never forget, the first time I learned this, I was six years old. Um, It was awesome because uh, we were the first family on my block to get the original Nintendo, you know what I'm talking about, with Mario, and we had this game called Kung Fu, which at the time I loved, and now as I'm saying it out loud, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word anymore. I might get canceled, but it's okay. Uh, I loved that game. We played Zelda. It was so fun. And I loved it. But the problem was, even though I know that uh, Santa and Jesus loved me because they gave me this thing, I knew that the devil was real because um, I had what you would call um, a big brother. Um, all right, younger child, you know, th- those of you who are older siblings didn't appreciate it. Well, so what would happen is uh, he'd get to play first um, because he was bigger and stronger than me and he could punch me. And then he'd say, well, then you can play after I die. And then after my game is over, and then he'd go and he'd play and then he'd be trying to, you know, save the princess and he'd fall in the lava in Bowser's castle. And then all of a sudden he'd be like, oh, it's my turn. He's like, no, I'm going to continue. My turn's not over. I'm like, no. So I'd try to take the, the control back from him and then he would punch me and then I'd scream, ah! And then my parents would come in and say, it's Saturday morning, can't I just sleep in or whatever? And I'm like, he hit me! And they're just like, we don't really care, but say you're sorry. He'd say, I'm sorry. And then I'd be like, are you really? You're sorry you got caught. You're sorry that my screaming is gonna mean that you lose Nintendo for the next 24 hours. You see, friends, it's easy to say I'm sorry, but it's hard to actually be sorry. And it's not just a kid thing. We see grownups all the time. They go and they have their pre-written statement where they say, I'm sorry for the way I made you feel, and I'm sorry for everything. But I'm like, did you actually say what you did wrong in that? Oh, no, the attorneys told you you couldn't actually admit to that because there'd be some liability on there. Or maybe they do this. They say, I'm sorry, but... And what happens is this. When there's something that breaks trust or harms a relationship or, or, you know, there's missed expectations. And then what happens, someone says, I'm sorry, but somehow it doesn't always seem to fix it. Why not? And what I want to tell you, friends, this morning is sometimes I believe that some of us have relationships that maybe haven't been able to be fully restored and healthy because we haven't walked through not only saying I'm sorry, but actually being sorry and changing actions. But it's not just our relationships with each other. Oh, you know that because you're gonna have to live some of that on Thanksgiving. But it's also our relationship with Jesus. Or sometimes we say, I'm sorry. We say, I'll never do it again. And we walk, walk right out those doors and we do it again. And then we're like, oh, what do I do with this? Did I lie to God? Did I lie to myself? What do I make of all of this? Let me show you how this works. Where's Pastor Joy? Is Pastor Joy around here? Joy! Oh, there you are. Hey, give Joy a round of applause. Come on up here. 
let me illustrate how this works, or maybe how this doesn't work. Joy, grab a seat right here. Okay. Um, what it, I want... What, go on. Because it went so well last service. Uh, let's just not talk about that. Um, uh, so let's imagine this. Let's imagine that you come into the office on a Monday morning, and just the, the night before, you had made your favorite meal, the one that uh, touches your mouth and your heart and your soul and your mind, and you just love it. And you go and you put your uh, l- little baggie in the staff fridge. What is that favorite meal that, that would, it would be? Well, my husband would have just made his French dip sandwiches. Okay. There, uh, shout out to the husband. Look at that. Good job, Barry. Uh, now, imagine that uh, you come in at lunch at 12 o'clock. You've been hungry. You've been craving this the entire time. And... Um, all of a sudden, you walk in at 12 o'clock, and you see uh, me with uh, some uh, French dip hanging from my lip here, and uh, you go in, and you realize there's no more French dip in the refrigerator. What are you thinking and feeling at that time? Oh, I'm incredibly bummed, and I'm really upset that you just stole my lunch. <sighs> now, in this moment, what if I said, I didn't do it? Well, his specialized horseradish sauce is dripping down your face, so you did it. Well, maybe it's possible that I didn't do it. Maybe um, Miss Lori did it, and I got uh, the sandwich from someone else. Miss Lori would never take my sandwich. Hey, hey, (laughs) hey, hey. hey. If you're new here, I am actually the pastor. They just treat me (laughs) like this all the time. Hey, now... What if I said, well, I did have it, but uh, there was no name on it? You didn't ask. Oh. What if I said, okay, I'm sorry I ate the sandwich. Will you forgive me? Sure. What does that mean? I said I'm sorry. You're a Christian. You're supposed to forgive me. Uh, Where's my sandwich? And you don't actually mean that. Oh, uh, ooh. Oh, you don't actually mean that. How do you know I don't mean it? Uh, you can tell by your tone and your posture <laughs> and the um, fact that you're not making amends for what you just said. I'm not made. making amends for it. So what if I said, I'm sorry, and then I went and got you another sandwich. I went to my favorite little place for sandwich, and I came and gave it back to you, and I said, all right, can we just move past it now? Well, sure, we can move past the sandwich, but I don't really trust you. Why not? I said, I'm sorry, and I got you a new sandwich. But I don't know that you'll do it again. So are you going to live in fear for the rest of your life that the sandwich thief is going to come like... You just made it about me. No. <laughs> what do you mean? It is about you. You're the one who doesn't trust me. Why, why, why is this all about me? It's your trust issues. I don't have to say anything to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, you just got 150 of your closest friends on yeah. your side. Um, uh, I've said I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That wasn't enough. So I actually went, and even though I was super busy, uh, I went and got you. So much busier than me. (laughs) Uh, I'm not taking the bait. Um, (laughs) Well, what else do you want? Like, Like, I don't understand why this is such a big deal. All I did was eat your sandwich. I got another one. No harm, no foul. What's the big deal? Why can't we just move past it? But you treated yourself like you were more important than me, that your time was more valuable, that your hunger was more important than mine. You didn't speak to anything that you really just did. Thank you for the sandwich, but uh, where's the protein bars and the gum and all the other things? I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't care. I don't care about the protein bars. I really don't care. Joking. Okay, I did not see this going this way when I planned this. Um, I think, Pastor Will, where are you? Um, um, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have a sense that we are no longer talking about the sandwich anymore. We're talking about something else. Uh, it's the way, it's, it's the choices that you make that put you above me. I feel devalued because you, you did something, you just put yourself first. So there's this heartfelt pain that you're feeling, so it's not just about the sandwich. 
I wouldn't use the word heartfelt pain because it's just a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> but it is the it is the action that you just did where you were you were more valuable than I was. Okay. But I've said I'm sorry. Yeah. I've acknowledged your pain. And now I've even gotten you a new sandwich. So will you forgive me so we can just move past it? Sure, but are you going to do it again? Um, are you going to label it next time? Do I have to? Can't you just ask? I don't know. It just seems like it's a shared fridge. You should just... How do I know? Again, I don't have to say anything. Shh, Dave, shh, you're throwing me under the <laughs> bus here. So what you're saying is you not only want me to say it, you not only want me to feel it, you not only want me to make it better, I want you to change your future actions. Change the future actions. Mm -hmm. So um, what would be a better way for us to um, share the sandwich and those protein bars and gum that you're now talking about in front of 150 folks? Mints, chapstick. Stop it, stop it. <laughs> um, uh, what would you like to do differently next time? Uh, when you see a sandwich in the refrigerator and it's not labeled, I just want you to ask if it's anybody. You're welcome to my protein bars and my gum and my mints. So Anytime I don't have to ask to. about that? You don't. You heard it. You heard it there. So you want me to walk up and down to every single person in the office and say, is this your sandwich? Is this your sandwich? I know your time is really valuable, but yes, I do. <laughs> I do. Can't I just say I'm sorry? You can, but it just, it makes, there's a dent in our relationship. It's, there's a dent in our trust. Cool. Are we still talking about the sandwich? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. All right, give Joy a round of applause. Yeah. I think maybe I didn't learn as a kid how to say I'm sorry. I think that maybe my little bro or my older brother didn't model it. And maybe when I was 16 and I got in trouble, I realized when I said I'm sorry to my parents, I was realizing I just said I'm sorry I got caught. I think I'm also realizing that sometimes when I said I'm sorry, I took the weight of responsibility that I should have and threw it on someone else. Let me explain. One time, there was a season in life. I had one kid at home. My wife, uh, we were lucky enough to, that she could stay home and be full-time with our kids. We just thought we were so lucky to be able to do that. And so I was working at a church and then I'd come home and there was a series of nights after, over and over. And I said, well, um, uh, I'm sorry I got caught up, but I got caught up with this really busy, really important thing at work. I'm sorry, but this was really important. And the first time she was like, okay, no big deal. The second time she was like, really big deal. And the third time she says, are you really that important? <laughs> uh, are the things you're doing that important? And I'm like, I'm working for Jesus in the ministry. And then what she realizes, oh, I, well, I can't be upset at you because you're doing God's work. And I can't be uh, upset at that thing that was going on because that person must've like really needed counseling or something was going on or you were preparing a really important event. So now I can't be that. So now all of this thing that you come home late and now she has to carry it. And now my apology actually made things worse. Because instead of me taking responsibility, I just heaped it right back on her. You see, friends, sometimes when we fail to learn how to say I'm sorry or fail to live how to live out how I'm sorry, what happens is sometimes these things get swept under the rug and then you're standing in front of 150 of your closest friends. You're like, oh, there's some chapstick involved or protein bars or things that I thought that was there. And somehow it's now Thanksgiving on Thursday and you're like, oh, I'm not bummed that they're coming over. I'm bummed because of what happened 20 years ago in our childhood, and we still haven't figured out how to move past that. But friends, it's not just a human thing. It's a spiritual thing. I think so much of us have dissonance in our relationship with God because we come to church on Sunday and say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Jesus, you are Lord. And then we go out there and live like we are actually in control, like we're the boss instead of him. And then we just get mad at ourselves or we get mad at, our past self, that Sunday morning self, who said, I'll never do it again, and they did it again. Or we feel embarrassed coming back to Jesus saying, I know I said I'd never do it again, but can we talk about that? What if there was a better way? What if there was a way that would actually bring relationships back together, not only between you and other folks, but between you and Jesus? Fortunately for you, there is a better way. And it's actually really important to Jesus. It's so important to Jesus that in the gospel of Matthew, one of the four stories of Jesus' life, it's the very first thing he teaches us about. 
It's kind of like the thesis statement. Now, the thesis statement, for those of you who probably remember uh, high school English, they teach you, you write a thesis statement, it's the one big idea, it's the most important thing, and then you write that five paragraph essay. I don't know why it had to be five. I thought it could have been four and it would have been good enough, but my English teacher told me that wasn't enough. So I wrote that five paragraph essay and had that thesis sentence and everything is based on that. And this is Jesus' thesis statement in Matthew chapter four, verse 17. If you got your Bibles, your device, you can pull it out or you can see it up here. And this is the very first thing he says. And so what Matthew is essentially saying, the the author of this gospel, uh, who is an eyewitness follower of Jesus, what he's saying is this is the most important thing. This is the key teaching. Everything else that you see in the next 24 chapters of this book should be seen through this lens. And it's this. In Matthew chapter four, verse 17, he says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. Now something like that word repent is kind of a churchy word. I'm guessing none of you have showed up to a meeting late at your work and your boss says, I need you to repent for being late. There's probably never been an issue between accounting and sales and they can't get along. And the the boss says, all right, we're gonna get you all together. We're gonna have a repentance meeting. It's kind of a churchy term, but it's an important term. You see, this word repent comes from a Greek word, that uh, metanoia. Everyone pretend like you're a Greek scholar for me and just say metanoia. Let's try it again, metanoia. Now, again, this word metanoia shares the same origin that you see the word metamorphosis. You know, like when a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and then woo-hoo, woo-hoo, it flies away. There's this metamorphosis. There's this transformation. So essentially Jesus is saying, be transformed. Why? Because the kingdom of God is near. Okay, this kingdom of God thing, we're gonna get to there like in like 17 minutes, but we're gonna get there in just a second. But let's just stick with this repent thing. It's a metanoia, it's a metamorphosis, it's a transformation, but it's a change of what? It's a change of four things. According to Jesus, repentance or this transformation is a change of number one, it's a change of your head, change of mind, change the way you see things. Number two, it's a change of heart, the way you feel about the world. It's number three, it's a change in behavior. And number four, it's a change in relationship or a change in allegiance. Let's come back and talk about how this works, right? What I wanna do is talk about the four R's of repentance and see what this would look like here differently in this experience with joy. The four R's of repentance starts with, the first one is, um, what is number one? I should have it on my notes. What does it say? Recognition, I did it. You see, recognition is this moment where you sit in this chair and instead of saying, "Eh, I didn't do it or I didn't do it, but it's the recognition that what of what I did. And it's not just seeing it differently, it's seeing it from another perspective. It's sitting here and looking from Joy's perspective and say, oh, At 11.45, old Kyle made a big mistake. He ate the sandwich. And recognition is often, not always, but it's often the first step in repentance. But I want you to see what had to happen. This is critical, friends, in your relationship with Jesus and with other people. Look at what happened. It goes from me sitting in my chair seeing things from my perspective, me trying to protect myself from blame. And the thing that repentance requires of us is to go and to look at ourselves from another perspective and say, old me did that. And it will never happen if you can't get out of your own shoes and see it from your own perspective. That's why some of you are in relationships And your partner just can't come and see your pain and what's going on. They can't see it from your perspective and why it's like you never really actually get back to being on the same team. But it's the first step, recognizing I did that. But there's a second part here. There's, There's what I call remorse. Remorse is this heartfelt thing that says, oh my gosh, I see what I did. See, recognition says that 11.45, Kyle ate that sandwich. But remorse says, oh my gosh, I'm sitting in your seat and I'm feeling what you felt. Oh my gosh, your boss just made you feel small and powerless and worthless. And now I see, and my heart breaks because what I did was hurt someone in a way. I just thought it was no big deal. 
I didn't realize what was going on, but there's this remorse that actually creates human connection. And that's why friends, some of you are have a relationship with someone where they say, I'm sorry, but they don't understand the depths of the impact of it. And they can't name the emotions that it took on you. And that's why you're like, yeah, I know you say you're sorry, but we're not fully there back yet. There's a third part. First, you recognize it. You go from your perspective to the other's perspective and say, what I did was wrong. The second is remorse, is you feel that. But then there's a third. And it's what I wanna call, uh, what did I call it up there? Restitution. Restitution for some of us is hard. In apartheid South Africa, it was, a, it, was a, it was an entire system built on um, economic and racial injustice. And it goes through this transformation. The apartheid system is, is, is thrown down. And now they're moving forward with this new idea of justice and equality and the affirmation of all humanity. And there was this famous story that emerged from it. And what happened was uh, there was a young white boy uh, who stole the bike of a young black boy. And then at the end of, of the, dis- in the midst of the dismantling of the apartheid, the uh, white boy came and said, I see what I did and I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And the young black boy said, well, what about the bike? You stole my bike. Can I have my bike back? And the guy said, oh, I'm so sorry. You didn't have that. I I see, I feel what you're going through, not having a bike. I too once didn't have a bike. I got one later, but um, I didn't. Can we just move forward? Well, what about the bike? And he said, he said, he said, are we just trying to move forward in this new way of justice and forgiveness? Forgiveness, that's what we're all teaching. We're all teaching about forgiveness and walking away from the past and moving forward. Can't we just walk into this new beautiful future together? To which he said, you can guess, what about the bike? Well, I don't even have the bike anymore. I sold it a long time ago. And this question of what about the bike is again, one of those four pieces that says, this is for me in this example, it's I'm gonna go get the sandwich and I'm gonna get it for you. Again, I gotta walk through the other steps. I have to recognize, I have to have remorse, but at some point there has to be some sort of restitution, restoration of what was taken. I'm telling you, this is both a, a interpersonal as well as a spiritual dynamic. I think this is one of the reasons why repentance is sometimes so hard for us. Again, this is for those of you who have been at church for a while. You've maybe heard this for a while. You said, well, I'm saved by grace, not by works. So I've confessed my sins. I feel sorry. I prayed the prayer and now I'm forgiven. But what we're missing is the kingdom of God has come near. I'm gonna make a little jump here, friends. So stick with me. You see, when Jesus says the kingdom of God has come near, it's opposite of what some of us think about in our relationship with Jesus. Unfortunately, too often times, we think that our relationship with Jesus is about getting us into heaven. And when Jesus says, no, 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 no. The kingdom of God is about getting heaven into you. What it's about is not about forgiveness from your sins so that you can go to heaven when you die one day, but it's about bringing justice and righteousness and restored relationship and letting it be so alive inside of you that it then changes everything. The kingdom of God is the reign of God. It's where God is king, where God is in control, where God rules. And what happens is when you allow yourself to come in and join Jesus' team and allow yourself to participate in the reign of God, it changes you and it changes your actions. And some of us live in what Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace, meaning I prayed the prayer, I said, I'm sorry, but there's no transformation down the road, which lets me say, are you really that sorry? Okay, let me take that back. Let me say it this way. Let me say it in a nicer way. I think what happens is we say we're sorry, but we then don't actually know how to live into it because what would I do? There's a famous Bible story about a short little tax collector named Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus has been making a huge fortune, stealing from people. And what happens is one day Jesus comes to his town and little short Zacchaeus goes up to the tree and Jesus comes up to him and says, yo, what up, Zacchae? He's like, I just thought I was hiding in the tree. I didn't know how you see it. The kingdom of God came near to Zacchaeus. 
And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, I want to go have dinner at your place. To which Zacchaeus must have been like, I didn't make anything. <laughs> to which he'd be like, why do you want to hang out with me? There's a whole crowd here. To which he probably also said, so you can see my big house and all the wealth that I've stolen from other people. And now Jesus is going to come and get up in my business and see the insides of my unjust oppression and stealing from people. What does Zacchaeus then do? He asks him over for dinner, but there's a part of the story that you need to remember. Zacchaeus then goes back and repays all the people that he's stolen from. You see, friends, my fear is that we live into, again, what I call cheap grace, what Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace, as I say I'm sorry to Jesus, I feel really bad about it, and sing a song or cry or whatever it may be, but there's no change in my life. That's restitution. But friends, there's a third part. There's a fourth part. The fourth part is this. There's a renegotiation of the relationship. Friends, this is, I'm gonna be careful here. Friends, this is why sometimes it's so hard to move forward because you're in a relationship with someone who hurt you or God forbid, abused you, used their power to hurt you in such a way, and they said, I'm sorry. They even cried tears to say it. They even then, you know, fixed whatever they broke. But then at the end, there's that question of, am I safe to be in relationship with you in the future? And let me be clear, friends. I wanna speak directly to those of you who are in some sort of abusive relationship, verbally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. God does not want you to live in a relationship where you are under the thumb of someone else's oppression and abuse. Jesus has come to rid the world of injustice and part of your living into the reign of God is living free from those things. But some of what that takes is a renegotiation of the relationship. And this may be a crass or simplistic thing, but someone says, hey, I, I'm said I'm sorry. Can I move back in? You say, well, you can move back in when we renegotiate the relationship. We know how it means to move forward. Yeah, you can come over for Thanksgiving again, but you got to walk through these steps and talk to me why it's not going to happen again. You, you, you can come and we can have lunch again together, but you got to tell me you got to do more than just make sure that I've put my name on the sandwich. You got to make sure that that's not going to continue to happen again, where you make me feel small and powerless. You see, friends, these four R's is what Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. What am I saying? Have a complete transformation by transforming your head, your heart, your actions, and your future relationship with this person by saying I was wrong, by feeling the weight of it, by repairing it if possible, and then by saying, what do we have to do to move forward together? And at every step you say, I will take my fair share of the responsibility. And how do you move forward? You move forward because the kingdom of heaven is near. It seems like these statements are so different. One is, repent, you messed up. How is that partner with the idea of the kingdom of heaven being near? This is where I feel like, let me just say it this way. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near is essentially we all sit in this chair where we say, I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna see the world from my perspective and I'm gonna do what's best for me. I'm gonna be the boss. And then in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, 100% man, 100% human, 100% God, sorry, 100% God, 100% human, comes and says, the kingdom of heaven is near. It's this close. And I'm inviting you. He's inviting you to come and participate. But what he's saying is there is a change that happens in repentance and it, there is this gap. And what he's saying is not only have I come near, I have come and I will touch your hand and carry you over. 
I will open your eyes so you can see what you did. I will touch your heart and empower your in, you so you can be transformed. But there has to be this repentance in our relationship with Jesus that goes say, I'm gonna be on team me to I'm gonna go and I'm gonna sit on team Jesus. For my whole life is about him. Where I look back on old Kyle and say, oh my gosh, in his angry, rebellious heart, he did and said things that not only hurt human beings, but also hurt the heart of God. Why? Because when I rejected God and decided to be boss of my own life, and when I hurt people that he loved, it hurt the heart of God. And he did that. And now as I repent, I come over here and I say, Jesus, tell me about the pain that that caused you. And he says, Kyle, it's not only that you hurt those people, because of your sin, I went to the cross to pay the price for your sin. And then I have this remorse because I realize that the one and only human being who's ever lived the perfect life, he lived the life that I should have lived and died the death that I should have died. So I can sit in this open chair because the kingdom of God is near. And I say, okay, Jesus, but, 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 but I'll, I'll never do that again. To which I think Jesus would say, hold your horses, buddy. <laughs> what I think you mean is I will try not to do this again. We just had baptisms this last time. And I asked this question, will you do everything in your power to love, trust and follow Jesus for the rest of your life? And I'm baptizing a mom and a teenage daughter and the whole thing. I'm like, <gasps> we might need to think of better language for this. Like, will you do everything in your power is the language. But let's be honest. I think Jesus says, I know you say you'll never do that again but I think we genuinely want to change, but we don't realize that we need the reign and power of God to come near to us. What is the reign of God? It's the power of God. It's where he is king. And what does he want to be king over? He wants to be king over those sinful impulses in my life. He wants to be king and have his power over the power of the evil one who wants to use me to ruin other people. He wants to have power over that. And if the kingdom of heaven has come near, it means the power of God is now available so that instead of me just saying, I'll never do it again, he gives me the power to not do it again. Because I've taken his invitation to be on team Jesus. But then there's this last thing he invites me to. There's this renegotiation of the relationship. I think Jesus would look at you and he looks at me and says, all right, you, you were God, you did it your way. How did that go for you? And I hope you're realizing I'm not a very good God. If you haven't learned that yet, just, just wait, you'll learn it soon. He says, now, there's this open seat where you get to do, where the kingdom of God has come near. I'm gonna invite you into my family. I'm gonna invite you into this chair, but we're gonna re renegotiate this relationship. But here's the thing you need to know is I love you and I want what's best for you. And what's best for you is if you let Jesus be God and let you follow Jesus. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I don't just have to say, I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't I just like have to like be a little bit better, like be nicer and, you know, like pay my taxes and don't curse as much and don't flip people off on the freeway. And wait, what you're asking is a whole complete and total change in our relationship where my allegiance is to Jesus over my allegiance to myself. Oh, Jesus, I don't know if I'm ready to do that. I wonder what Jesus does and says when we look at him and say, I'm not sure I'm ready to let you be the boss of my life. I'm not ready to let you tell me what to do in my sexuality. I'm not ready to let Jesus tell me what to do with my finances. I'm not ready to let Jesus tell me what to do with my family. I can say this in the second service because it's not recorded. But there's moments where I'm saying, I've been so transformed by the love and power of Jesus. And then 15 minutes in with my in-laws, I'm like, what is wrong with me? <sighs> Wait, Jesus. I need your power so that I can live in this invitation to participate in the reign of God. 
So again, what is the thesis statement of Jesus? He says, let me transform every aspect of your life because my power has come near and given you an invitation. What Jesus did when he became a human being is he said, boom, there's an invitation for you in this chair. What he did is he made it crystal clear. He said, this is why the kingdom of heaven has come near. He said, it's come near for you. So as the worship team comes up, I just want to ask you this question. What is the invitation for you? Maybe the invitation for you is to realize that with another person, you've only walked through some of those parts of repentance. And that's why you and or that person can't get past it because you haven't done the full part. And you're realizing, oh, for me to really have a reconciled relationship with that person, I have to do more. And he's inviting you to own your peace. Maybe that's not it. Maybe there's a person in your life who has not walked through that process and they will not own their peace. And you're sitting here being like, I'm feeling the pain of what they did. I've done everything in my power. And there's a piece of this is how do I let go of this pain and bitterness that I carry? Let me clarify one thing, friends. There's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness says, I am not going to carry the weight of what that person did to me. Reconciliation is when two people come together and say, let's fix this and get on the same team together. I need to name for you that for some of you, you need to walk through those steps of repentance with someone. And for some of you, it's different. You need to forgive and let go, which is so hard. I preached a whole sermon on it back. You can find it on the YouTube channel. And you need to learn how to say, how do I let it go? But for some of you, you're looking at this and thinking about this in your relationship with Jesus. And you said, oh my gosh, he's calling me to so much more than Sunday morning attendance, than a casual tip in the tip jar, than just being a little nicer from time to time. What Jesus is inviting me into is a full-blown transformation. And there's a wrestle in your heart that says, do I really want Jesus to be the king, to be the boss and to have my whole life aligned with him? I think that no matter where you've been, no matter how long you've been thinking about following Jesus, considering Jesus, we all have parts of us that says, can we give it to him and trust him to be the boss and allow him to transform us? I wanna invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I believe the God of the universe sits here and he invites you. He invites you to sit in this chair. He says, the kingdom of heaven has come near to you right here, right now. And I believe that God has three invitations for you. The first is for those of you who are carrying hurt from what people have done to you and you want to, or maybe maybe you wanna move forward. Maybe you don't know how, but you realize that you're carrying hurt this morning. If that's you, can you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? I see you. I see you. Yes. Yes. All over this room. God, I pray for these beloved people who you've created in your image. And my heart grieves for the pain done to them and the way it smudged your beautiful image, your beautiful creation. God, I pray that you'd give them wisdom of how to work things out with that person or how to let it go if they are unable to come to peace with that person. God, give them the wisdom to know if there's a letter that needs to be written, a conversation that needs to be had, a past that needs to be entrusted to you. If their heart's longing for justice and it seems like there'll be no justice in this lifetime, I pray they will trust you, the ultimate, the one and only good, true, perfect judge and they will entrust justice to you so they don't have to carry this weight forward. 
The second invitation I wanna offer you this morning, friends, is for those of you who say, in my relationship with another human being, there's another step for me to take in my repentance to reconcile and bring the relationship back. And there's a step that I know that God is calling me to take. I'm not even sure how or when or what that'd be, but I know that God is prompting me in this moment that there's a step that I need to take to right or wrong. If that's you this morning, will you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I see you, friends. God, I pray that you'd give these people wisdom and courage, wisdom to know what they can and cannot do, courage to take the steps and trust in you that does not look to the outcome of a hard conversation, that does not look uh, to how much something's gonna cost to repair God, but God, that they know that there's things that they can do, but they cannot control that other person. I pray that you would give them wisdom and that they take the steps that are in their power so they can live blameless in your sight. They can go to bed at night knowing they've done everything in their power to make it right. Give them wisdom and courage, God. The last invitation is for those of you who feel invited by Jesus to take a next step to go deeper in your relationship with him. Maybe you realize there's a next step in your repentance, in your trust, in your transformation. And if this morning you feel like God is inviting you to take a next step to sit in this chair and take a next step in your repentance with Jesus, will you just go ahead and raise your hand in this moment? I see you, yes, yes. Yes. God, I thank you for the promise of your word that says, if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just. You are faithful and that you will forgive us. You promise that you, as far as the east is from the west, that you will remove our sin from us. So Lord God, we pray not only for forgiveness, but for transformation. God, I pray that you'd open up our eyes so we could see the depth of our sin, open up our hearts so we can feel the weight that it caused you and caused those around us. God, I pray that you'd give us new eyes to try and fix what we broke. But God, lastly, I pray that we'd submit ourselves to you and say, God, let your kingdom come and your will be done. Let's do it your way instead of my way. Let's let you be the boss instead of me, God. Invite us into a deeper place of trust in you a deeper walk of repentance as we follow you. Lord, we thank you that your kingdom has come near to us and that you've invited us to have a seat at the King's table. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen.